Hi there, we're so delighted to introduce to you our free church app. Uh, this app is loaded with features and resources that will greatly enrich your life. So head out to the app or Google Play stores, search for All People's Church Bangalore and download the app right now. It's going to greatly enrich your journey with God. Greetings and thank you so much for tuning in to Living Strong today. Uh, it's always our privilege to be able to come to you, uh, spend this time with you in the Word of God, and also take a few moments to pray with you. Uh, we trust that these programs coming your way are enriching your life and empowering you, equipping you uh, to live a life that's constantly growing uh, in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, we've been talking about the life of David the last several weeks. Today will be the final program uh, on, uh, this, in this series, uh, examining the life of David. We've called this series, David, Man of One Desire, uh, simply because the two outstanding things about David's life uh, that all of us would recognize immediately, first of all, is that God himself called David a man after my own heart. And uh, we also are quick to recognize that David's uh, purpose statement of his life uh, is there in Psalm 27 verse 4 when he says, One thing I have desired of the Lord, one thing I will seek after, that I may gaze upon the beauty of the Lord, that I may inquire in his temple, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord and inquire in his temple. So that's, you know, David summing up uh, the passion and the purpose and the pursuit of his heart, which is, I want to go after God, I want to know Him, and I want to be able to have this close communion with Him. I want to inquire in His temple. And we see that uh, this became uh, a, a not only a guiding factor in David's life, but really became a sustaining, grounding factor in David's life. Because throughout his life, uh, we see David going to God and saying, God, teach me. He, David constantly inquires of the Lord. Uh, uh, you know, and all the decisions that he needs to make, especially the decisions that affected the community, affected people at large, uh, that he would go and ask the Lord. He would inquire of God and hear from God and then make his decisions. On the program today, as we kind of wrap up our examination of David's life, uh, we are calling this David's final years, the last few years uh, that he was as king over all Israel. And we just highlight a few things from, uh, from his life. Um, this is from 2 Samuel chapters 13 to 24. We'll also pick up a few things from 1 Kings and also from Chronicles. i uh, just put that together all in story form. Now, very sad to say that, you know, as uh, David began to prosper and reign and uh, everything was going well, uh, there were a few lapses in his life. Uh, and when we come to the final phase of his life, we see that some of these lapses had to do with his own family, and there were serious consequences uh, uh, resulting from those lapses. Uh, the first thing that we see, and the first thing we want to highlight, of course, uh, in this is uh, uh, his uh, lapse in, hand, in the handling of the situation of his uh, own children. Now, uh, of course, all of these were half-brothers and so on. And um, we find an incident recorded for us in 2 Samuel, the 13th chapter, where uh, uh, Absalom and his sister Tamar, uh, and with their half-brother Amnon. Now, uh, Amnon uh, was a half-brother, and he violated his half-sister Tamar, who was the sister of Absalom. And uh, when the news got to David, uh, David was grieved, uh, but for two years, he never took any action. He never did anything about it. And uh, Absalom was very angry because he was waiting for his father to do something about what had happened in the family. And David didn't do anything. Now, uh, the Bible is very silent about this. 
It does not tell us why David didn't handle the situation among his own children. Why didn't he do something? Why didn't he, you know, discipline Amnon? Or why didn't he step in to protect Tamar? Or uh, He didn't do anything. Now, maybe, I mean, we could only speculate. Maybe he was too busy uh, with the administration of his kingdom. Uh, there is no record of any major battle he had to fight at that time. Everything was going fine. Maybe he was just busy with the administration of his kingdom. Or maybe he just didn't want to get involved. Uh, either way, his negligence of this matter made Absalom very angry. And so finally, after waiting two years, Absalom decided to take matters in his own hands. So he invited his half-brother, Amnon, to a home, to his house for a party, and he killed his own half-brother, Amnon. But of course, Absalom knew that this would displease the king. And so he left Jerusalem and he ran away uh, 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 for three years uh, into hiding. Now, the Bible records here in 2 Samuel 13, verses 37 to 39, that David mourned for Absalom. And verse 39 says, the king David longed to go to Absalom, but he actually did not do anything. Here again, for whatever reason, David did not do anything. He grieved the fact that Amnon was dead. He grieved the fact that Absalom ran away. And he wanted to go to Absalom. He longed for Absalom. He said, like, I want my son back. But he never did anything. And again, there is no reason why David did not take any action in this case. And so finally, it came down to this point where Job, Joab, uh, who was the commander-in-chief of David's army, when he saw all this happening, he actually went and spoke sense to David. And in some way, it was an indirect rebuke to David. Uh, he said, you know, you are concerned about Absalom, but you're not doing anything about it. Why did you send word and tell Absalom to come back? I mean, if you really care about him, why don't you just get him back? And, you know, it was like the tube light coming on in David's mind, so to speak, that after three years, he finally sends word and says, Absalom, come back. So Absalom comes back because the king has sent word, his father has sent word uh, to come back to Jerusalem. Uh, everything's going to be fine. Absalom comes back and again something strange happens. Second Samuel 14 verse 28 says, And Absalom dwelt two full years in Jerusalem, but did not see the king's face. I mean, can you imagine? Absalom, his, his father said, Absalom come back to Jerusalem. Absalom comes back. But then when he comes back to Jerusalem, David doesn't go and meet him. David doesn't talk to him. David doesn't say anything. So this is some unexplainable behavior uh, on the part of uh, David. Why did he not deal with issues with his children? Why did he not, you know, call Absalom back early on? Why didn't he reconcile things with Absalom? Why is he keeping Absalom for two years in Jerusalem and not even going and meeting him? Uh, it's something that cannot be explained. But unfortunately, this lapse in David's part of taking care of his own family has serious consequences. Because in his lapse, being a father to Absalom, what happened? This very son now triggers or sparks an uprising. Absalom begins to rebel against his own dad. You know, Absalom, of course, has been, you know, thinking through all of these things. My father didn't do anything when my own sister Tamar was violated. He kept quiet for two years. So I had to take things in my hand and I had to kill Amnon. And then I ran, he says, you know, Absalom is thinking all this. I, I ran for three years. My father didn't do anything. After three years, he sends word. And now I'm here in Jerusalem and he, he hasn't even come and met me. You know, something is seething within Absalom. Rebellion. This is, an, uh, this is a recipe for rebellion. The negligence from David's part. Uh, in dealing with his own family. And so what does Absalom do? 2 Samuel 15, verse 1 through 6, Absalom positions himself at the city gate. Uh, he gathers people to himself, and he begins to say things like, you know, you want justice, the king is too busy, just come to me, I'll take care of your situation. And he begins to, you know, uh, deal with people, he begins to win the hearts of the people, 
But really, all of this is in preparation for an uprising against his own father, David. So the people began to fall in line with Absalom. And uh, the Bible says there in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 14, 15 and verse 6, it says, Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. I mean, he literally got them all on his side. So finally, having done all of this, Absalom rises up against his own father, David. And there's a rebellion. David has to leave Jerusalem. He has to run for his life. There's a battle that follows. Uh, and that takes us through 2 Samuel chapter 18, when eventually Absalom dies. And now David grieves for Absalom. As 2 Samuel chapter 18, verse 33, the Bible says, David was deeply moved and he mourned for Absalom. He says, oh, my son Absalom, my son Absalom, if only I had died in your place, oh, Absalom, my son, my son. You know, this is, again, like I said, something so unexplainable. If he really cared so much for his son Absalom, why didn't he reach out to him? Why didn't he connect with him? Why didn't he do something? Here, after he dies, he's grieving so much. And once again, Job, uh, his commander-in-chief, comes and rebukes David and says, David, why are you mourning for Absalom like this? I mean, you're mourning for Absalom. Uh, uh, he was the one who, was re- who caused this whole uprising, caused this whole rebellion. You're mourning for him like this. I mean, this is uh, a shame to the rest of us who protected your life and protected your kingdom. And so David has to, you know, like he's really knocked back to his senses. So this is something in David's life that we cannot explain. Why all of this? Uh, but this just shows to us that David was a man like all of us. He had his weaknesses. He had his flaws. He was not a perfect man. Uh, he had failures in taking care of his own family uh, that resulted in so much of problems in his household and for his kingdom. And yet God was merciful to David. Just two more things we want to highlight uh, in David's final years. Again, another lapse in David's part. You know, as his kingdom was flourishing and uh, everything was going well, of course, there was this season of rebellion that had taken place uh, because of Absalom. Absalom was dead now. Things were quiet. And the Bible says that for some reason, David decided to number, do a census, number the people in Israel. Now, this was something God had told his people long back that you should never do. He said, never take a count, never take a census of all the people of Israel because God just wanted him, them to trust that they, God would multiply them as numerous as the sand of the seashore, as numerous as the stars in the sky. God promised to do that and has wanted his people just to walk in faith and confidence that God would fulfill it. And so he said, you do not number the house of Israel, do not number them. Now, the Bible does tell us that Satan provoked David to do this. Uh, That's an interesting thing, that the enemy would decide to attack the king, the person in leadership, and provoke him to do something that obviously was wrong before the eyes of God, and therefore would have consequences not only on David, but on the whole nation. And for some reason, David was not on guard. Uh, For, you know, we, we can't, the Bible doesn't tell us we could just speculate, maybe, He wasn't in that place of communion with God. Maybe he wasn't walking as close with God. We do not know. But Satan succeeded in provoking David or pushing David to do this. And so David ordered the numbering of uh, taking the census of Israel, the numbering of it, and therefore that brought judgment upon uh, the whole nation. And God, uh, you know, had to speak to David through the prophet God, saying, you know, you've you've sinned. Uh, The nation has to be judged. Here, I'm giving you three options. What do you want? David chose the, uh, the shortest option. He said, okay, God, three days of plague in my nation. And uh, the prophet God, uh, God speaks to David and says, David, you need to go and you need to make a sacrifice uh, as an offering to God, as a sign of your repentance that you have sinned against God. Uh, uh, and so as David, once again, takes responsibility of his action, uh, we see something you know, positive uh, of David's character when uh, David had to go and, and make this offering uh, to God, uh, the, the, the piece of land and the offering, everything was offered to David as, as free. He says, David, it's all here, just, just make the offering. And David says, no, I will not do that. I will not offer to God something that does not, I will not offer to God anything that does not cost me something 
So David, even though he's king, even though everything was given to him for free, he says, no, I'm going to pay for the land. I'm going to buy the land. I'm going to set up the altar. I'm going to pay for the, all the sacrifice. I'm going to make the sacrifice at my personal expense. And that is something notable of David, even though he made the mistake. He made the mistake, he recognized it, and he was willing to pay for the entire sacrifice that needed to be made in order to stop the plague. So uh, David offers that sacrifice. You know, and very interesting, that parcel of land that David purchased today has become uh, the place of the Temple Mount, where the temple was rebuilt, where, was, uh, where Solomon built the temple, uh, uh, the amazing temple. Uh, and uh, of course, it was destroyed and rebuilt. But that Temple Mount uh, was, was, uh, was on the parcel of land that David purchased himself to offer the sacrifice to stop the judgment of God on the nation of Israel. So even though David made a mistake, we see uh, you know, this beautiful thing that David understands that he is not going to offer sacrifice to God without personal expense, without it costing something to him. So David does this. He offers that sacrifice and God, uh, you know, uh, releases the nation from judgment. The last thing we see uh, in David's life in his final years is that he makes preparation for the building of the temple. You know, David has seen the tabernacle. It's just a tent. Uh, and the worship has been going on, and they were desired to build a temple, a physical structure uh, that could house the presence of God, that could be a place of worship for the people of God. But God spoke to him through prophet Nathan, saying, look, you're not going to build it, but your son Solomon is going to build a temple. But you can make the preparations for that. So uh, the final thing, as David hands things off to his son Solomon, uh, he gives Solomon the blueprint of the temple. This is how the temple has to be built. He makes all the necessary preparations. You know, he brings in all the materials, the gold, and everything that is needed uh, in order to build the temple. And then when Solomon is appointed as king, David hands things over and says, look, this is in your hands to build this temple for the Lord. And, 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 and you know, Solomon takes it forward from there. And we see that the temple of uh, Solomon, Solomon's temple is built, but it was all put in place by David. And David did a successful transition, handing over that assignment to his son Solomon so that he could fulfill something that David carried in his heart, but God did not give him permission to do so. So as we wrap up this whole series on the life of David, you know, we see how God works through the life of somebody who is devoted to him. David was a man devoted to God. He had his flaws. He made his mistakes. Uh, he had his ups and downs. He had his difficult times. But yet we see God working faithfully, orchestrating things in David's life. We also see how David pursued God. He asked the Lord. He sought the Lord. Uh, he was willing to receive input from his leaders, especially the two prophets that he had around him, Nathan and God, and his own commander-in-chief, Joab that they were people who spoke into his life and corrected him at those uh, important junctures in his life that he would receive correction so he would make the right choices and the right decisions. And here was a man, David, a man after God's own heart and a man who pursued God with passion. And he lived out a life that till today is remembered as probably the greatest life uh, outside of Jesus Christ that the people of Israel honor and identify themselves with the life of King David, their patriarch uh, after Abraham, uh, their patriarch David. We trust that these insights from the life of David were a blessing to you, were an inspiration to you, that you and I will take these things, meditate on them, mull over them, and begin to imbibe them in our lives, that we could pursue God that they, the way David pursued, uh, be people of, after God's own heart, be people of one desire. Let's pray together before we close. Father, we acknowledge, God, that even in our weaknesses, in our flaws, that you are still working, carrying out your purposes in us, for us, and through us. And Lord, I pray that you will help us by your grace to be people after your own heart people of one desire, 
pursuing you through all the seasons of life, through all the ups and downs of life. And we will be a people who pursue you with you as the center of our focus. Help us to do this in our day and time, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for being with us. And until next time, remember, live life the Jesus way. It's always exciting to journey with the Lord as He takes us from season to season as a church family. And especially to enter into this new season of uh, writing new songs, recording them, worshiping God together and uh, capturing these moments has been quite an adventure. This song, Come Alive, is from Psalm 1, which declares over and over again that blessed is the man who sits not, who stands not, who walks not in the ways and things that God does not approve of. In other words, it means that when we sit, stand and walk in the ways that God approves, in the things of God, in the ways of God, that's when we truly start living. That's when we come alive. Come soak in my presence, light